It's the Real News Network, and I'm Greg Wilpert. Conflicting reports from Israel-Palestine seem to indicate that the Israeli government and the Hamas party, which is currently governing Gaza, either signed a historic ceasefire agreement or are, are about to enter into a renewed spiral of violence. After the Israeli invasion of Gaza in 2014, which claimed the lives of over 2,000 Palestinians, the Israeli military did not conduct major operations inside the Gaza Strip because Hamas forces were either able or were able to deter an outright in, in Israeli invasion. Palestinians' Great March of Return, which we have covered extensively here at the Real News, was and continues to be an example of nonviolent form of protest with considerable impact on the Israeli public and on the state of Israel's perception in the world. Israeli forces responded to the nonviolent protests by killing over 130 unarmed Palestinians in Gaza. And this Friday, the English language uh, newspaper Haaretz reported that Israeli military killed another two Palestinians and wounded over 240 when the March of Return protests continued. During the week, the situation was already escalating. Just after Hamas issued a statement that a ceasefire is at hand, Israeli forces assassinated two Hamas fighters and Palestinians responded with a new barrage of homemade rockets injuring nine Israelis. Israeli bombs then killed a pregnant woman and her one-year-old daughter. A surviving relative, Khaled Abu Singer, spoke about the bombing. خرجت رشقات من المقاومة ولم تكن هناك قواعد عسكرية ولا قاعدة عسكرية ولا موقع عسكري ولا أي شيء يذكر هذا المفاجأة المدوية اللي كانت في المنطقة ولا أهل البيت عساكر أصلا كلهم أبرياء مدنيين أبرياء أطفال After the exchange, Hamas and also the Islamic Jihad in Gaza declared a unilateral ceasefire on Wednesday A few hours later, the Israeli government leaked that it accepted the ceasefire and plans to honor it Joining me now to discuss the latest developments in Israel and Palestine is Assad Abu Khalil. He is a leading expert on Middle East politics and a professor of political science at the California State University Stanislaus. He regularly writes at his new, uh, website, the Angry Arab News Service. Thanks for joining us today, Assad. Thank you for inviting me. So recently we spoke to Jamie Steiner Weiner about the book Moment of Truth, and you wrote a uh, chapter for this book about the Palestinian armed resistance in Israel against Israel. Um, over the last few months, though, we've been seeing uh, Hamas supporting nonviolent, uh, the nonviolent uh, Great March of Return, uh, and also trying uh, out re reconciliation talks with Fatah in Cairo, and now calling for a ceasefire with Israel. Do you think that Hamas is in the process of abandoning abandon, uh, armed resistance? I will get to Hamas in a second, but let me make a couple of things clear right at the outset. The first thing is the number of Palestinian casualties exceed what was reported in the introduction. It is something like 250 in the last several months who were killed, butchered by the Israelis. And I also should say that the number of those injured is so large in the thousand that there is no specific number that I could find. In fact, it varies from one place to another. Uh, the second thing I want to say is that Israeli newspaper, because you cited Haaretz, typically and consistently undercount Palestinian victims. And the third thing I want to say, in the casualty tally that is provided by the Israeli occupation government, they always play tricks with the numbers. Not only do they undercount Palestinian casualties, but they overstate Israeli casualties. For the last decade, for example, Israeli propagandists came up with a new technique whereby if somebody is startled to hear a noise outside, that is reported as a casualty. That is a psychological victim. And they put them in the list of injured from whatever uh, firecrackers Hamas has been sending toward Israel and so on. The fourth thing I want to say is that there is no question that this is an Israeli method of negotiations with its enemies. This is a state that was founded by a movement, the Zionist movement, that is predicated on the firm belief, on the racist, on the firm racist belief that the only language to be dealing with Arabs is the language of force. And I'm not talking about 1948 or 1936, from the turn of the century, one of the founders of modern Zionism, cultural Zionism, Ahad Ha'am, when he went to Holy Land in the early 20th century, and he came horrified of how the new Israeli settlers, Zionist settlers coming from Europe 
were treating the local population, treating them like animals. So there's a consistent history of that. Now, uh, it is true that Hamas seems to be uh, in a state of utter confusion and not clear what they want to do. And they are in a state of weakness. And this weakness is basically permitting Hamas to forfeit basic rights of the Palestinian people. But the thing is, those rights of self-determination and resistance by all forms necessary, just like any people who were occupied in the past, cannot be forfeited, not by Hamas, not by Abbas, and not by any of these transit leaders who come and go, and the Palestinian people and the Palestinian struggle continue. Hamas is responsible for the state of weakness it found itself in, because it has been playing uh, political games, trying to switch allegiances, one day Iran, another day Turkey, another day Qatar, another day Saudi Arabia, and eventually, and Syrian government in the past, and then in the Syrian war, they played games. In the beginning, they said with the Syrian government, and then they supported the so-called uh, revolution, and then they switched back. As of late, they said now they support the Syrian government, and they remember it for its past support for Hamas. So this is a movement that is as bankrupt as the Fatah movement was when it agreed to sign the dreadful Oslo agreement. And something similar is about to be signed by this movement of Hamas. They are even negotiating with the Israelis about abandonment of flying kites by the people of Gaza. To that degree, they think they can forfeit the rights of the Palestinian people and the various forms of struggle. But that is not going to work. You see, Hamas is clearly under uh, guidance from the Egyptian government, which is a close partner of the Israeli government uh, in the strangulation of Gaza. And they are also entering negotiation with the Oslo collaborationist regime in Ramallah in order to survive. They want to survive as a movement, but if anything, that is going to guarantee their demise. And I personally will not be shedding any tears over their demise. What will remain is the Palestinian people and their will to struggle. And Hamas, as we have been reading, is negotiating not only uh, a long-term hudna, they call it. They use the Arabic name as if that will change what it is. This is an acceptance of the state of Israel, something that they used to claim that they were opposed to. Uh, the second thing they are also committed to is abandonment of all forms of struggle. A, basically, they're going to become the local Gaza collaborationist police in the form it's not dissimilar from that of Ramallah, and they will be uh, physically preventing any forms of resistance against Israelis if they reach that agreement with the occupation government. Let me just turn now to the Israeli side for, uh, for a moment. Uh, in the past, the Israeli military used extreme violence uh, for just the tiniest excuses. For example, back in 2008, they launched an all-out all bombardment to kill participants in a graduation ceremony of Palestinian police officers just because it was organized by Hamas. And in 2012, they launched an attack uh, to preempt a ceasefire agreement that Hamas was about to accept. Uh, more recently, though, the Israeli military mounted much smaller responses to the killing of an Israeli soldier by Palestinian snipers. Why do you think the Israelis have changed their usual tactic of invading with tanks and destroying entire neighborhoods? Oh, I mean, there's a very simple reason for that, which is that the resistance in Gaza has been quite effective in resisting, uh, you know, land invasion encroachment by the Israeli occupation army. And in the last showdown in 2014, there was a very strong and firm resistance uh, by the various groups inside Gaza. Uh, the Israelis now know the rules of the game are not what they used to be. When I was a child growing up in Lebanon, Israelis used to almost invade South Lebanon, where I come from, on a weekly basis. They used to bomb refugee camps from North Lebanon all the way to the South at any point. And the Lebanese government was entirely uh, colluding with the Israeli occupation and totally silent. If anything, they were trying to prevent the Palestinian resistance from engaging in self-defense. Those days in Lebanon are far gone because the Israeli regime, the Israeli occupation army was humiliated on the battlefield in a way that never uh, happened to it in its entire history of the Arab-Israeli conflict. And for that reason, since 2006, the Israelis are scared of the volunteer force. That's what it is. These are Lebanese, southern Lebanese people living there who volunteer in the resistance movement 
it used to be communist, it became Islamist and change and so on over the years. But what it is, is this is the will of the local people to resist Israeli encroachment and invasions. Something like that happened in Gaza and will happen again. And for that reason, uh, they prefer these long-term uh, bombing and shelling and drones and so on. And they know there are no penalties. Uh, neither the European nor the Americans will ever say a word to that. And we should underline the Israeli uh, war machine is now acting in a political context that has been most favorable to it since 1948. The Arab state system led by Saudi Arabia is basically on the very same side with the Israelis and have absolutely little to say in terms of support for the Palestinians. If anything, the only role they play is to fight any form of Palestinian resistance and to put pressure on what is left of resistance groups and movements among the Palestinians and to strangulate the people of Gaza in order to extract political concession in the service of Israel and the Trump administration. Now I just want to turn to uh, the divide within the Palestinian groups that is between Hamas and Fatah. Uh, many Palestinian activists uh, accuse President Abbas of cooperating with the Israeli siege on Gaza in order to put pressure on Hamas. And he is in no hurry to sign a reconciliation agreement with Hamas. Do you think that if Hamas and Israel sign a ceasefire agreement, uh, that it will undermine the legitimacy of the Palestinian Authority in Ramallah? No, nothing can legitimize uh, the authority of a collaborationist regime set up by the occupation uh, army of Israel, as well as by the U.S. administration, a declared enemy of the Palestinian people and their rights. And the thing is, uh, the role that Mahmoud Abbas and his collaborationist clique in Ramallah are playing in Gaza is not an accusation that they are participating in the pressure on Gaza, they declare that. I mean, their intentions have been made very clear. They are putting pressure in order to set up a uh, contracted collaborationist regime in Gaza that works for the benefit of the Israeli occupation. What we are witnessing really is part of the deal of the century. This is preparation for Jared Kushner and company in order to make an announcement about what is going to be different about Gaza, the West Bank, and enterprise zones and things of that nature that is going to mean nothing to the Palestinian people. Uh, in order to do that, they wanted to pacify the population of Gaza, which has still manifestation of resistance. And this is what's happening. There is a war on the people from Gaza, from Israel, from the Egyptian regime, from the Ramallah clique, as well as from Hamas, which wants to basically prepare the grounds for the return of Abbas authority to Gaza and for a, an accommodation that is beneficial to the state of Israel. So finally, what is your assessment of this uh, most recent ceasefire? Is there any chance for an extended ceasefire in the near future, or should we expect a return to the pattern of Israeli invasions every two years with an ever increasing number of Palestinian casualties? I mean, I think one has to be uh, a fool to trust uh, the intentions or the signatures of Israel in any agreement. Uh, the history of the Arab-Israeli conflict is that this is an occupation state that is willing to violate, na inter I mean, uh, the UN uh, Security Council resolutions, UN declarations, uh, international law, as well as bilateral agreements between different governments, Jordan or Egypt or whatever. And they have violated ceasefires in Lebanon with the Palestinians and so on. So anybody who has any view of history knows that they cannot be trusted. And anybody who thinks that if Gaza were to surrender on, I mean, by Hamas uh, to the Israelis, that's going to make things different or that Israel is going to stop the killing, Basically, if they believe that, they haven't been seeing what's happening in the last two days in the West Bank. I mean, we talk about Gaza, but let's look what's happening in the West Bank. Israelis have also been arresting and shooting in the West Bank, and totally without any scorn from the collaborationist regime of Mahmoud Abbas. Uh, so uh, there is no chance of success. Uh, Israelis never treat agreement as if they're going to be deterrent for its own will to commit massacres and war crimes. Mm. Okay, well, unfortunately, we're going to have to leave it there for now. I was speaking with Assad Abu Khalil, Professor of Political Science at California State University, Stanislaus. Thanks again for having joined us today, Assad. Thank you very much. Have a good day. And thank you for joining the Real News Network.